Hi everyone, welcome back to Dave's Math Channel. I'm your host, David Tear, and it's been a while since I've made a video on uh, number theory, so I figured it's high time I did another one. Anyway, today I'm going to talk about um, Gaussian integers and Gaussian primes. And the picture in the middle of the slide is a picture of uh, some Gaussian primes. I'll get to, into this later. Anyway, let's begin. So first we have to add, uh, I have to define what Gaussian integers are. Gaussian integers are actually pretty simple. Um, if you know some complex, basic complex analysis, complex numbers, all a Gaussian integer is, it's a, it's a, it's a complex number of the form a plus bi, where a and b are both ordinary integers. And they form a lattice, like the picture on the bottom shows. They form a 2D lattice, just a square lattice. So um every every point on the square lattice is a gaussian integer and that's what they are and we, re we usually write the set of gaussian integers as c uh with i and z with an i in brackets to the right z stands for the integers it just means we're joining i to the integers another way to write a z plus z i um and uh one thing you should note about the gaussian integers is they have some very useful properties. They're, you think of them kind of like the ordinary integers are for the real numbers. I mean, if you guys know anything about ring theory, I don't know if you know what a ring is, but it turns out that the ordinary integers form what's called a ring. All that means is that there's two binary operations on the integers, addition and multiplication. Um, and uh, it satisfies the usual properties, like... Uh, you know, um, uh, it's it, first of all, it's it's a group with respect to addition. It's uh, uh, in the case of the uh, ordinary integers, is a abelian group, uh, commutative with respect to addition. But it also has another operation called multiplication, and uh, it's closed with respect to multiplication. That means that you can multiply two any two integers, get a third integer. Uh, not only that, but it's also associative, commutative, and distributive. Uh, you know, uh, with respect to addition and multiplication, just the usual properties. That's what makes it a ring. And uh, it's not a field because uh, you can't divide. If you try to divide two integers, you don't always get an integer. As a matter of fact, you can't, you can, you can't divide by zero. Even as a field, you can't divide by zero. But uh, you can't even divide necessarily two non-zero integers and get an integer. You get a fraction usually. A rational number. And the Gaussian integers have all the same properties as the ordinary integers. They're also a ring in the same way. Um, I mean, that's provable. But that, that's a nice property of the Gaussian integers. Um, anyway, that's what they are. And uh, there's also something called Gaussian primes. And this is a very useful concept. I mean, because, uh, um, you know, just like the, the, the Gaussian integers, I think I've probably convinced you already, that the Gaussian integers share a lot of properties with ordinary integers. And another property they share is that they have certain elements which we can call primes. And what do we mean by that? Well, uh, let's think about what we mean by ordinary primes. I mean, usually you define, you define a prime as a positive integer whose only factors are one in itself. Uh, but uh, a better way to define primes, you can also define primes of all the integers that can be negative as well. A better way to say that is a prime is an integer, positive or negative, whose only factors are a unit, namely plus or minus one. Those numbers are called units. Minus one's a unit as well as plus one. And they're associates. So for instance, five is equal to one times five or minus one times minus five. That's a unit times associate. There's no other way to factor 5, so 5 is prime. But similarly, minus 5, which is minus 1 times 5, or 1 times minus 5, is also prime. So the negatives of all ordinary primes are also prime. You might have not learned that primes that way, but that's the way number theorists like to think of primes in the integers. They can be positive or negative. But 1 and minus 1 are not primes. Those are what are called units. And similarly, we can define Gaussian primes in a very similar way. So first we have to say what the units are in the Gaussian primes. Well, units in general uh, are just things that have absolute value one. So in the case of the Gaussian integers, there's actually four units, plus or minus one and plus or minus i. Uh, 
Uh, I is a unit as well because its norm is 1. The absolute value of I is 1 and minus y, I as well. So uh, we say that a, a Gaussian integer, uh, which we usually write as alpha, alpha equals a plus bi, where a and b are ordinary integers, we say that alpha is a Gaussian prime uh, if and only if it's only prime factorization, only possible way to factor it as a product of two Gaussian prime integers is as a unit, plus or minus one or plus or minus i, times uh, associate. And what is an associate? Associate is just uh, a unit times this thing you started with. Um, so uh, that's, that's what a Gaussian prime is. Pretty similar definition. A little bit more complicated because we first have to define units and associates. But it's the same idea, you know. So uh, anyway, this picture below shows all the Gaussian primes among the Gaussian integers. These are with uh, abs norm less than or equal to 500. And the norm of a, ga of, a, of a complex number is just the square of its absolute value. So if you like, the absolute value of all these Gaussian primes shown is uh, less than or equal to the square root of 500, which is about 22. So these are really just all the, all the uh, Gaussian primes with absolute value uh, up to about 22, which is uh, just the radius of this circle. Um, and uh, you can see that you know, uh, most of the Gaussian integers in this range are not prime, just like for the ordinary integers. And they get a little bit rare as you go further out. So uh, they kind of look, uh, in that sense, kind of like the uh, ordinary primes. Uh, but they're, they're still pretty abundant. I mean, even if you made this circle really, really big, which I didn't do here, you'd still get quite a few Gaussian primes even out near the edges, uh, even though the density does go down. It doesn't go down very fast. Um, and anyway, that's the Gaussian primes. And why do we care about Gaussian primes? Well, uh, it turns out that the Gaussian primes have a lot of really useful properties. For one thing, their norm, if you calculate the norm, uh, so if pi, you usually write the letter pi for Gaussian primes, not 3.14. That might be a little confusing, but uh, here we're using pi the Greek letter pi to represent a Gaussian prime. So suppose pi equals a plus bi is a Gaussian prime. Well, then its norm is a squared plus b squared. And it turns out that pi can only be a Gaussian prime if its norm is either uh, equal to a prime of the form 4k plus 1, or another way to say it is a prime congruent to 1 modulo 4, or it could be 2. It turns out there is a Gaussian prime of norm 2. That's 1 plus i. Or any of its associates, 1 minus i minus 1 plus i minus 1 minus i. Those are all Gaussian primes of norm 2. But otherwise, uh, every, every Gaussian prime has to have a norm that's an ordinary prime of the form 4k plus 1. So, for instance, there is a Gaussian prime of norm 5, 2 plus i, or 1 plus 2i, if you like. There's actually eight of them. And, and uh, there's actually two... Um, two kind of classes of associates. It turns out that for every, except for two, except, except for one plus i, which has just four associates, uh, and just one, one unique, there's one unique uh, Gaussian prime of norm uh, two up to associates, but there's actually two uh, different Gaussian primes of norm p, where p is 4k plus one, uh, was pi, if you like pi, in the case of uh, norm five, is two plus i, and uh, you know all its associates, or you could take pi bar, the complex conjugate of pi, which is two minus i. That's also a Gaussian prime of norm five. Um, so anyway, that's that's Gaussian primes of norm four k plus one. But there's also other types of Gaussian primes. They're not as interesting, but the other types of Gaussian primes are just ordinary primes of uh, of uh, uh, of the form 4k plus 3. So for instance, 3 is a Gaussian prime. Its norm is 9. Its norm is 3 squared. Uh, yeah, and, and there's also four associates of 3. There's three, plus or minus 3 and plus or minus 3i. In the same case, if p is any prime of the form 4k plus 3, then uh, um, p is a Gaussian prime, and so is all its associates, plus or minus p and plus or minus... PI are all.
Gaussian primes if P is of the form 4k plus 3. So those are all the Gaussian primes. We know what all the Gaussian primes are just in terms of their norm. And that's a very useful thing to know. And it has a lot of important consequences. Uh, uh, one consequence is that, uh, for instance, every, every prime of the form 4k plus 1, it turns out, has a unique uh, representation of the sum of two positive integers a and b, where a is greater than b. For instance, 5 is 2 squared plus 1 squared. 13 is 3 squared plus 2 squared. 17 is 4 squared plus 1 squared. You can keep going like that. It's always unique, and there's always exactly one way to do that. Yeah, well, that's what it means by being unique. But if, if p is a form 4k plus 3, then there is no representation of p as a sum of, of two uh, um, squares of integers. And in general, uh, we, we know how to find all numbers that are uh, of this form, all, all numbers that are the sum of two squares of integers. It turns out they all have a special type of prime factorization. I think I get to that on the next slide, but uh, uh, maybe I do on this slide. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll just tell you. Um, so it turns out that we know exactly what kind of numbers uh, can be written as a sum of two squares. It turns out that, uh, say, n uh, is a sum of two squares. That means that, that every prime factor of n uh, of the form 4k plus 3 has to have an even exponent. If, if any of those exponents are odd, then you cannot write uh, n as a sum of two squares. And if they're all even, then you can. That, that's a very useful thing to know. So, uh, um, and it turns out those have density zero. Those have asymptotic density zero. Most, most integers cannot be represented as a sum of two squares. But we know the ones that can. And that's just a consequence of this prime factorization of Gaussian integers. Kind of a nice result, I think. And uh, yeah, let me go into factorization of Gaussian integers. So just like we can factor, you know, I mean, I, I don't know if I mentioned this already. I think I mentioned a few slides ago. I, maybe I should just go to the slide where I mentioned this first. Um, I think when I first talked about Gaussian primes. Yeah, the, 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 the ring ZI is a very useful ring. It's a ring that's called a unique factorization domain, or a UFD for short. Um, so what is a UFD? Well, the, the ordinary integers of a UFD, what all that means, a UFD is a ring uh, like the ordinary integers that has unique prime factorization. You probably know the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, which says that every, every integer, every positive integer, any integer, uh, because as long as we let primes be negative as well as positive, any integer, it turns out, has a unique uh, factorization in terms of a product of primes, prime numbers, unique up to ordering of the factors and associates and all that. And it turns out the same is true for the Gaussian integers. Gaussian integers is also a UFD, which means that every Gaussian prime, every Gaussian integer rather, has a unique factorization uh, as, a, as a product of Gaussian primes you know, possibly up to units and associates, which we don't really care about that much, and ordering. So that's a nice thing to know. That means that we can find, uh, we, can, well, we can find the unique prime factorization of any, any Gaussian integers. And actually, it's not, it's not that hard to do that, it turns out. The way you do this is first you factor its norm. So uh, uh, I give an example on the bottom of the slide. Uh, I guess I talk about a lot of stuff on this slide, but the main thing you have to know is just that there exists an algorithm, a pretty straightforward algorithm for uh, finding the prime factorization of any Gaussian prime integer in terms of the product of Gaussian primes. And I give an example below. Um, let's consider the Gaussian integer, al I call it alpha here, uh, equal 11 plus 3i. Let's find the Gaussian prime factorization of alpha. Well, how do we do that? The first thing we do is we calculate the norm of alpha, which is pretty easy to calculate. That's just 11 squared plus 3 squared, which is 130. And then we factor 130. That's not hard. It's just 2 times 5 times 13. And, uh, um, and 2, 5, and 13, luckily, 2, we know there's a Gaussian prime of norm 2, 1 plus i. 
So uh, we've already found one factor because um, that's a unique uh, Gaussian prime of the associative norm too, and that must divide um, alpha. And indeed, if we divide alpha by two, by one plus i, we get a new Gaussian integer, which I'm calling beta here. And it turns out beta is equal to seven minus four i. So now we just have to factor beta. And the norm of beta is now five times 13, because we've already factored out two. And luckily, five and 13 are both uh, congruent to one modulo four. So that means that there are Gaussian primes with both of those norms. And uh, like I said earlier, there's actually two different ones uh, up to associates. So for instance, five, there's two essentially different Gaussian primes of norm five. There's two plus i, which I call pi five, pi sub five. And there's also its complex conjugate, pi, which I call pi five bar. That's two minus i. We don't know which of those, one of those, Exactly one of those must divide beta, but we don't know which until we try to divide it. Uh, it turns out that uh, pi 5 does, 2 plus i does divide 7 minus 4i. If you do the division, you end up with uh, a third Gaussian uh, integer, which I'm calling pi 13 here, and that's equal to 3 minus 2i. And why am I calling that pi 13? Because if you calculate as norm, you don't even really have to calculate, I already factored out 2 and 5. We know its norm is 13, and 13 is prime. And uh, that means that um, um, this, this Gaussian integer has to be a Gaussian prime. That's what I'm calling a pi 13. It's a Gaussian prime of norm 13. So now we're done. We found all three uh, Gaussian prime factors of 11 plus 3i. And we have 11 plus 3i equals 1 plus i times 2 plus i times 3 minus 2i. Pretty neat. Anyway, um, that, that concludes my video. Oh, oh, there's one more thing I want to talk about. This is an important conjecture. So far, everything I've said so far has already been proven. There's a lot that's known about Gaussian integers and Gaussian primes. But, they, you know, like, like everything else in number theory, there's a lot of things we don't know yet. There's a lot of conjectures. Uh, there's tons of conjectures about the ordinary primes. And, and there's also conjectures about the Gaussian primes. And I think... One of the most interesting ones is whether or not we can walk through the Gaussian primes. And what do I mean by that? Well, uh, you can imagine, you know, putting a, a picture of the Gaussian primes on your floor. And, uh, I mean, let's just look at a picture of the Gaussian primes again. Uh, yeah, look at this picture on the bottom of the slide. Or maybe it's even better to look at, um, I think there's a little bit bigger picture here. Uh, the Gaussian primes are just the things marked as dots. And you can see they're kind of dense, right? I mean, you can see there's, there's pretty much Gaussian primes everywhere you look. But like I said, they get rarer. They tend to get rarer as you move farther out from the origin. The question is, how rare do they get? I mean, do you ever get the, that they're rare, so rare that uh, if you're standing on one of these Gaussian primes, maybe uh, you're not able to leap to the nearest one? from there uh, because maybe the nearest one is farther than you can step. You'll fall down if you try to step off of that Gaussian prime. That's kind of the idea. And uh, here's another picture. I think this is a better picture. You want. Uh, but you, I think you get the idea. But, uh, and you can, you can make this statement mathematically precise. Suppose we have uh, two, two Gaussian primes, pi one, or just suppose we have one Gaussian prime, pi one. Is it always the case that there's a second Gaussian prime, which we can call pi 2, whose distance from pi 1 is less than or equal to some, some uh, fixed constant, which I'm calling d. That's your step size. So imagine you can't step farther than d. Maybe d is 5 feet. You can't step 5 feet from the prime you're standing on, the Gaussian prime you're standing on. That means you fall. There's no way you can get off pi 1. It, it, is that ever the case? We don't know. I mean, I think most of, most mathematicians suspect that uh, it is possible to walk through the Gaussian primes, that there is some maximum distance t. But nobody's proven this yet. It's an interesting problem. So anyway, uh, that, that concludes my talk on Gaussian integers and Gaussian primes. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. Long live math, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.